Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Madhuvanti Ghosh, the Alstoff Associate Curator of Indian, Southeast Asian, and Himalayan Art at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I would like to warmly welcome you all to our first Kipper Lecture since the pandemic. Thank you for joining us tonight. And I would like to start by acknowledging our gratitude to Barbara Levy Kipper for making this lecture possible. It has been a long-term dream of mine to invite Professor Dehejia to the Art Institute to speak about South Indian bronzes. So thank you, Barbara, for making this dream a reality. <laughs> Our distinguished speaker tonight, Vidya Dehejia, is the Barbara Stola Miller Professor em Emirata of Indian and South Asian art at Columbia University. In the course of an illustrious career, which has spanned both teaching and curatorial and museum management at Smithsonian's Freer and Sackler Galleries, she's combined research with teaching and exhibition-related activities around the world. She's worked on widely disparate fields from early Buddhist art, the esoteric temples of North India, to the sacred bronzes of South India, and the art of British India. Her background in classical Sanskrit and Tamil, and knowledge of a range of modern Indian languages, has proved invaluable. Her writings have incorporated everything from translations of ancient poetry and material from unpublished manuscripts in order to illuminate uh, an artistic milieu uh, as we will see tonight. In 2012, the President of India awarded her a Padma Bhushan for outstanding contribution to art and education. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Vidya Deheja as she presents the lecture, The Thief Who Stole My Heart, The Material Life of Sacred Bronzes from Chola, India, based on her recently published book of the same title. And just if you're interested, the book is available in our bookshop. Vidya, over to you. Um, Madhu, thank you for that very gracious introduction. Barbara, thank you for having invited me to present this year's Kippa Lecture. And to you, my audience, thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy the evening. Chola bronzes are widely acknowledged as holding pride of place in South Asia's aesthetic pyramid. And one might assume that Chola temples, sculptures, bronzes, their historical milieu have been researched at considerable depth and that the, a plethora of books and monographs must surely exist on the subject. But that's just not so. Why? What has deterred researchers? Could one factor be the enormous scope of the Chola artistic heritage? The Chola period, after all, covers some four and a half centuries of amazing artistic creativ creativity temples, sculptures, bronzes, jewelry, music, dance, and literature were produced in a fairly expensive, expansive region of South India. Just one pointer to the richness of the period, over 1,000 stone temples were built during this time. They were not royal temples, they were quite small, but each temple then housed several bronzes to fulfill its ritual cycle. I'd like to start by introducing you to a master sculptor. He's right up there in the League of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci of Renaissance fame. In fact, in fact I'd say Michelangelo and Leonardo move over. <laughs> Will you step back in time and join me in the year 1010 at dawn? In the small coastal village of Tirvangadu, along the Bay of Bengal, close to where the Kaveri River enters the ocean, a master sculptor stirs the wax and resin that is bubbling in a large pot. He is carefully preparing the mixture 
for the image he is going to model. He thinks back to his conversation two days ago with the commander of a military regiment of the Chola monarch, Raja Raja. The commander had sought him out, cash in hand, to ask him to create a majestic bronze image of Shiva leaning against his bull mount. Yes, the master would make Shiva majestic, but he could not forget the hymn of child Saint Samandar, who addressed Shiva as the thief who stole my heart. The master resolved to make his image of Shiva the ultimate heart stealer who would captivate one and all. This image, dedicated in the year 1011, is his resulting masterpiece. Elegantly poised, resting weight on one foot, the other foot bent at the knee, crossed in front, lightly resting his toes on the ground. This bronze shiva, about three and a half feet tall, is bewitching in its beauty. Shiva's left arm rests elegantly on his hip. His right arm is bent to place his elbow upon the now missing bull. The firm tone of his lithe body gives him a commanding presence, and there's the barest hint of a smile about his lush lips that transforms him into an accessible figure whom the devotee may confidently approach. Our master has abandoned the usual mode of portraying Shiva with his matted locks piled high on his head. Instead, he's created a piece that is uniquely charismatic. Taking the length of Shiva's matted locks, the master wound them round his head to create the effect of an elegant turban with just the serpent hood and the top of the trumpet flower emerging above his locks and the crescent moon, Shiva wears the crescent moon in his locks, do look at the way he has positioned that crescent moon while he was modeling in the wax so that it weaves under and over one of Shiva's dreadlocks. The face, framed by the usual diadem, this pattam, carries a serene contemplative look. His third eye adorns his forehead. He wears a large circular earring in one ear only one year, the other remains unadorned, and one is reminded of Saint Samandar's hymn, describing that thief who stole his heart as wearing a earring in one ear only. He is richly adorned, as you can see in the bronze, with necklaces and Brahmanical sacred thread, a high waistband. He's got that short dhoti slung well below his navel. It's held in place by this um, elaborate jeweled belt, it has a lion head clasp. And completing his ornament, his adornment, is an elbow band, a wristband, anklets, rings on eight fingers and eight toes. Only the middle finger and middle toe are left unadorned. It's unfortunate that we do not have this master's name. We must refer to him only as the master of Tiruvangadu, whose Shiva temple housed several of his masterpieces. It's rare for Chola bronzes to be securely dated, but at Tiruvangadu we are fortunate in having several inscriptions on temple walls and base moldings that provide information about the donors and their gifts. None of these inscriptions has been translated into English, and even a complete Tamil version is not available in print or even online. And one has to make a trip to the offices of the Epigraphical Survey of India in the town of Mysore to get access either to the original rubbings taken from the temple walls or to a hand-transcribed copy of the inscriptions. In the case of our glorious Shiva, a partly damaged inscription dated to the year 1011 informs us that it was set up by this military chief who belonged to the military regiment known by the name of Emperor Raja Raja, who ruled from 985 to 1012. The donor, we get his name, Kadamban Kolakavan. He came from a town which was a mere eight miles away. And the inscription tells us also that this military chief is now making a gift of jeweled ornaments to adorn his bronze. 
more about jewelry in the second half of our time together. The companion image of Uma, who always accompanies Shiva, stands in serene elegance, just over three feet tall. Gracefully poised in Tribanga, this triple bend contrapasto, her oval face with its diadem is topped with a tall conical crown. At the rear, you can just about see there is that halo-like circle of glory. Her long skirt clings to her legs. It's slung again, way below the navel, held in place with belts. Her slender torso, gently rounded breasts adorned with three necklaces, and there's a sacred thread again that snakes its way between her breasts. The distinctive treatment of the hands, the ringed fingers, and the gently rounded fingernails are among the signature touches of this master. An inscription dated to the year 1012 contains intriguing information about the joint donation of this copper image of goddess Uma to accompany Shiva as lord with the bull. The gift was coordinated by a certain Lord Sarpan, and he ensured that 11 other individuals contributed their share towards the expenses involved in commissioning this image of Uma, as also the image of the bull, now missing, to accompany the Shiva bronze created the previous year. The superb artistry of our master sculptor is seen also in this sensitive four-piece bronze group representing the divine marriage of Shiva and Uma. God Vishnu on the far right and his consort Lakshmi on the far left, what are they doing here in the context of a Shiva image? Well, in Tamil Nadu in South India, and in South India alone, Uma is considered to be Vishnu's sister, or we can put it the other way and say Vishnu is considered to be Uma's brother, and the brother of the bride always has a role in the wedding ceremony. Uh, Lakshmi on the far left acts as Uma's friend and confidant. Notice the manner in which the master has positioned a shy Uma to stand hesitantly a few steps behind the confident bridegroom, her shoulders curving inward slightly as if to shield her body. She presents quite a contrast to the confident consort of Shiva with the bull that we just looked at. And consider the empathy shown by the master in his portrayal of the confidant's understanding of the bride's diffidence. She uses both her hands to gently urge Uma to move closer to the groom. These images uh, and the, the Shiva with the bull and the consort um, would have stood on a lotus base placed on a pedestal, and they would have been about four feet high and would have been quite dramatic as they were carried uh, in procession in, through the temple and through the town. I'd like to introduce you to two more images of God Shiva from the hands of our master sculptor, both of about the same height, four feet in total. The first is Shiva as enchanting mendicant or begging lord, which is a form truly beloved of Shiva devotees in Tamil Nadu. The exhilarating, sensitive treatment of the naked beggars, profoundly haunting. In this manifestation, Shiva is believed to have wandered the Tamil country in wooden clogs, do notice he's wearing wooden clogs, from village to village and then from home to home, accompanied by his pet antelope that you see prancing with him. The saints of Tamil Nadu sang of the inexpressible radiance of this form of Shiva, whom they address simply as begging Lord, Pichadevar. They described how the women of every household were hopelessly enamored of him. 
one of the saints, Saint Sundara, sang eloquently of this paradoxical, even eccentric, you might say, form of Shiva, placing each of the verses of the hymn in the lips of a different woman who came to give him food. Here is one such verse. What strange attire is this of yours? The music of the Tamil tongue adorns your speech. Meanwhile, the serpent dances on your hand. We bring you arms, but how to give it to you when your serpent hisses? Pray tell us, handsome one of the forests, does not the radiance of your form mock the glory of the setting sun? The saints often used conversational language in what are sacred hymns, almost colloquial language. Another hymn by Saint Upper, it highlights even more dramatically the spell cast by the beg begging Lord over the women who encounter him. In this colloquial give and take, here's what one woman says to the other. Listen, my friend, yesterday in broad daylight, I'm sure I saw that holy one. As he gazed at me, my garments slipped. I stood entranced. I brought him arms, but nowhere did I see that cunning one. If I see him again, I shall press my body against his body. Never let him go, that wanderer who lives in Otriur. You know, erotic poetry in the north of India is always addressed to Krishna. Not so in the south. It is Shiva who is adored by all his worshippers. Um, he's adorned in this particular bronze, three necklaces, that sacred thread, a waistband, armlet, elbow band, bangles, rings now on 16 fingers, no, 16 fingers and forearms, so 16 fingers and eight toes. Uh, the saints had a lot of fun with their hymns. We called, we, they are the sacred canon of South India, but they really had a lot of fun with it. The same child, Saint Samandar, who sang of, of the thief who stole my heart, playfully sings about the fact that the pet cobra is supposed to wrap itself around him to serve as a loincloth. But as Saint Sambandar says, the serpent has a mind of its own and it fully reveals Shiva's form. There's a tiny detail here that we could miss, but one that the master sculptor wished to portray, the forked tongue of that serpent. It's better seen if you look at it sideways at this angle, but then again, it's only the really close looker who's going to see it. Shiva's matted locks here splay out in this halo-like formation around his head, and they're partially held back by that diadem. And you can see the serpent on one side, the crescent moon and the, the, on the other. And in the center, you have a human skull. And though you can't quite see it, it is inset with silver eye sockets. The sensitive and delicate treatment of those fingers that curve and plant just as in the attention to those fingernails are once again the hallmarks of this Thirvangadu master. And look at the sensuous nature of those tight rounded buttocks, an altogether invigorating and stimulating image created in the years following the Shiva and Uma of 1011 and 1012. There are two inscriptions in this temple, one dated to 1046, another to 1048. They speak of several gifts of jewelry to adorn this image, but both use the past tense to refer to the original dedication of the begging lord by a certain Amalan Sheyabayar, making it clear that the master created bronze well before the date of this set of jewels, which starts with the enlargement of a previously made gold snake, a new gold string necklace, a gold sacred thread, a gold victory garland, a gold choker necklace, and so on and so forth. One more 
powerful creation of this riveting um, master that I show you, Shiva as half woman, in which Shiva takes his consort Uma's body as one half of himself, divided vertically down the middle into a female half with a single arm and a male half with two arms, this bronze has a more exaggerated tribanga than his other images. It's interesting to compare the image with the master's Shiva from the marriage group. And we appreciate how subtly the distinctions between the male and female halves are expressed. Matted locks and broader jawline versus the female softly curved jawline and jeweled crown. And similarly, a comparison with Uma as consort of Shiva with the bull emphasizes how the shoulder on the male side is broader compared to the softer curve of the female side. The obvious distinction, of course, is the breast and the considerably indented curve of waist and hip on the female side that contrasts with the straight lines of the male body. Do we know who is responsible for commissioning this sacred, this uh, spectacular creation? Well, a sheer dogged determination to work through inscriptions led to the woman who donated this bronze to the temple. I came, it's a lengthy inscription of 44 lines dated to the year 1047. It speaks of lands donated by the Chola king for various purposes, gives us tedious details on the boundaries of each piece of property. And when we get to line 35, we hear of the king making arrangements for the daily worship of Shiva as half woman, saying that the bronze had been installed in the temple by a lady named Tupayan Uttamacholi. And in order to ensure worship of the image forever after, the king ceded to the temple all taxes from speci a specified piece of agricultural land. Why would the king take so deep an interest in providing for an image installed by Uttamacholi? Very likely we heard of, of the kings having an anuki, somebody really close to them. I will use the word anuki and not sort of lower that status, which has a high status to that by using the word mistress. Before we leave Turungadu, I think it's appropriate for me to speak to you of practical issues, affordability. Not all would-be donors of festival bronzes had the wherewithal to commission their images from the Thiruvangadu master. We just saw that 12 persons combined their donations, a sort of a form of crowdsourcing, to be able to get the master to create the bronze of Uma and the bull to complete the imagery of Shiva with the bull. And yet, devotion, devotional fervor would have demanded that other images be dedicated to the temple in order to enable an expanded festival cycle. Such donors probably commissioned their images from the master's apprentices, who created superior bronzes in the same style, but they lacked the pizzazz, the vitality, that spark of the master. I'm going to show you just one such commission a threesome group featuring God Subramanya, the younger son of Shiva and Uma, flanked by his two consorts. The God is 36 and a half inches high, as high as the master's Shiva with the bull, and his two consorts are proportioned accordingly. Wearing a tall crown, the richly adorned forearm God stands in a graceful posture with weight resting on his right foot, and the elegant flanking goddesses are posed almost as mirror images of each other with minor distinctions. They are fine bronzes following a decorative scheme similar to that of the master. Yet look at the exquisite smile on the face created by the master and the somewhat, shall we say, flabby jawline on that modeled by the apprentice. And we might make a similar, closely similar comment about the images of the two consorts. The work of the apprentice, probably his chief apprentice, is remarkably good. 
but it just can't match the master's perfection. Let me move on, however, as I do in my book, Beyond the Sensuous, to ask questions of this material that has not been asked before. The bronzes are not merely exquisite masterpieces created by talented wax modelers and accomplished metal casters. They are material objects that interacted in meaningful ways with human activities and with socioeconomic and religious practices. I'd like today to give you a few glimpses of some of the material on which I have focused in my research, which was originally for the Washington DC Mellon lectures. Chola bronzes, as we all know, are sacred images commissioned by temples for festival worship. There are a total of 311 temples in just the three districts of Trichy, Tanjavur, and Nagapatnam that form the heart of Chola territory along the lower reaches of the Kaveri River. On a conservative estimate, each temple housed at least 10 bronzes to fulfill its ritual cycle, resulting in a total of over 3,000 sacred bronzes in just the three districts over the period of four and a half centuries of Chola rule. Every Chola bronze, as we all know, is portable, intended to be carried in procession through temple and town during the festivals celebrated at each temple. And you see the holes and lugs on lotus bases and lower pedestals for poles to be threaded through them to enable their being carried um, in procession. I talked about the Tamil saints, they lived during the 6th and 7th centuries, and they sang the glories of Shiva, also of Vishnu, there were Vishnu saints, um, and they sang of portable images. They sang of Shiva going on his rounds amid the glitter of a pearl canopy, and they spoke of the beauty, the splendor of the festival day. There were no processional bronzes like that, like these in the 7th century when these hymns were composed, and early festival images were most likely created of wood. Around the year 855, which is the start of the Chola period, a dramatic change occurred that involved the introduction of copper on a scale never before seen in Tamil Nadu. Now began the creation of what temple inscriptions described as sacred forms of copper Sheputirimeni is the word. Technical studies indicate that in these images have a copper content that varies between 90% and 95%, with the remaining 5 or 10% being comprised roughly equal quantities of tin and lead. All Chola bronzes are solid bronzes. The image from the Cleveland Museum of Art, which they were kind enough to weigh for me, it's a little under four feet tall, and it weighs 257 pounds. Chola bronzes are extremely heavy pieces of solid metal. Bronzes from just about every other part of the world are hollow, and thus far more economical in their use of metal. Now, in the course of the intensive research to preparing this material, I discovered that there is absolutely no copper that may be easily extracted, cost-effectively extracted in Tamil Nadu itself, and that no one has a clue regarding the source from which the copper was obtained to create this multitude of Chola bronzes. Isn't it extraordinary that such an important issue has been overlooked by all of us without so much as a second thought? How and from where was copper procured in sufficient quantity to revolutionize the creation of processional images, images and also the production of the many copper plate inscriptions issued by Chola monarchs? The recently uncovered Thiruvindalur copper plates of one of the emperors of the year 1065 consists of 85 sheets of copper Together with that ring seal that holds them together, the whole thing weighs 330 pounds. 
I worked out that 200 tons of copper would be required to create bronzes for Chola temples in just those three districts, the three small districts, Trichy, Tanjavur, Nagapatnam. Forget anything north of it. Forget Shidambaram. Forget any, anything closer to Chennai. Um, my probing revealed an unexpected and exciting possible source for Chola copper in neighboring Sri Lanka. Thanks to the work of Arjuna Tantilage and his Sri Lankan colleagues, all scholars of archaeology and metallurgy. The Seruvilla copper belt in northwestern Sri Lanka, I tried to indicate it on the right in the coppery color. Uh, it's close to the port of Trincomalee and within easy reach of the major city centers of Anuradhapura and Polanarua. It has yielded archaeological evidence of copper ore extraction on an industrial scale during the first millennium. Sri Lankan scholars are positive that the copper was exported, but they have no idea where it went. Is there anything special about Ceruvilla copper? Yes. It has a clear and exceedingly rare trace element of cobalt nickel. With the help of the Freer lab, three of five Chola bronzes were tested, and they do show high traces of cobalt nickel. But it's going to be necessary, and this requires international cooperation, for that ceruvilla ore itself and for samples from Chola bronzes to be studied in the same lab under identical conditions and identical calibration. And um, until that is done, my proposal that Ceruvilla was one source of copper ore for Chola bronzes can only remain a very strong possibility, not a proven fact. At the same time, this shift from wood to the large-scale creation of sizable copper sculptures certainly indicates that a new and, I would say, readily available supply of ore had been identified. It is an amazing concept, is it not, to think of one supreme deity as a master of dance? And it was to the late queen, 10th century queen, Shembian, who popularized this form of Shiva and made his image an indispensable icon for the Tamil country. I have a whole chapter in the book on Queen Shembian. I'm not going to talk about her here. Instead, I'm talking about Shiva as wondrous dancer. And you may wonder why I'm referring to this image as wondrous dancer than by its better known popular term of Nataraja, dance king. I myself have avoided the use of the term Nataraja in my book because the term itself was totally unknown during the Chola period. It was introduced into the Tamil country only during the 13th century, at a time when Chola rule was ending, and it occurs for the first time in a 13th century inscription of the Pandya rulers, not of the Cholas. Throughout Chola rule, dancing Shiva was addressed by a number of expressive Tamil names, and you can follow the English as I read you the names in Tamil. Manikya Kutar, Arahiya Kutar, Kutadum Devar, Kutu Perumal, Kutu Nayakar, Adavallan, Adal Vidanga Devar, Arbuda Kutar, my favorite, wondrous dancer. My intention is not to speak about the lost wax process, though it would seem from the images that I am about to. I show these images only to point out a couple of crucial issues. First, that the master creates his image in wax. When that wax is covered with clay and baked, the wax image melts and runs out through an aperture left in the base. So here's the point. The master's original image is then gone. Yes, it has left behind a clay mold that is an exact replica of the original. And when molten metal is poured into it, it will yield an exact replica of the master's wax image. But then, in order to reveal that metal image, the clay mold has to be broken apart, thoroughly smashed into smithereens. So 
neither the original wax image nor the original clay mold remains. In other words, each Chola bronze is a singular piece that cannot be replicated in any mechanical manner, unlike Greek, Roman, Renaissance, Baroque bronzes, or even relatively modern Rodin bronzes, where the master's original is preserved specifically for the purpose of replication. To satisfy the demand of a donor who wants an image exactly like the one the master made for a particular temple, the Chola modeler will start from scratch, create another original in wax, go through the entire process again. It may be closely similar. It is, after all, the same master's hand at work, but it cannot be a replica. Each Chola bronze, in that sense, is unique. What were the circumstances that permitted the creation of so many temples and such large numbers of exquisite bronzes, despite the constant warfare that the Chola monarchs undertook to retain and to expand their empire over a period of four and a half centuries? Inscriptions indicate the prime position held in Chola times by rice paddy. Rice was the measure by which wages were paid to temple employees. Rice was the measure by which goods were bought in the town markets. And it was the innovative irrigation system put in place by the Cholas that made possible the rich agricultural wealth that enabled donors to commission large numbers of bronze images and to further adorn them with lavish jewelry. More on jewels in a moment. If ever there was a monarchy that rose to power on the basis of irrigation and agriculture, it is the Cholas. The irrigation system they put in place remains to this day, it is still used. It remains to this day the mainstay of the prosperity of Tamil Nadu, that is one of the richest agricultural areas of India. The topography of the region through which the Kaveri River winds its way. There are two monsoons that affect the river, southwest and northeast. Uh, that they affect different parts of the lengthy, lengthy Calvary. There is then the slope of the land in the deltaic area. There's the texture of the soil. Made all of this possible. The Chola genius lay in recognizing how to harness what seemed to be disparate and unrelated items and make them work together in harmony. So let's turn to this extraordinary Chola passion for jewelry. Ornaments created solely to adorn the sacred bronzes, regardless of the fact that the images are created in bronze decked with jewels already. All jewelry was made of gold, most was studded with a variety of gems, and Chola inscriptions give us astonishing details of each item of jewelry created to adorn these festival images. Entire sets of jewelry were given to adorn them from head to toe. And the inscriptions often talk of the hooks and clasps. And if you look at the lower right, you can a rear view of a sacred bronze shows you the hook and clasp that the artist modeling in wax so painstakingly detailed. How important could it be? But it seems he was a perfectionist. I'm going to give you two examples from dozens of inscriptions in the Tanjavur temple that illustrate the magnitude of such gifts. By the way, none of the jewelry I'm showing you is Chola, of course, none has survived. So Raja Raja's queen, Panchavan Mahadevi, had presented already to the temple an image of Shiva accompanied by consort Uma, and the two images, we are told, stood upon individual lotus bases, then placed upon a common rectangular pedestal, it would have looked something like this. In the year 1014, the queen made a lavish gift of several items of jewelry. The two together, the, the upper group is for Shiva, and the lower one is for Uma. They, the, there are more than 10,000 pearls in this one gift. Um, 21 items of jewelry to adorn Shiva, strung with close to 8,000 pearls, 
Uma's 10 ornaments included 1909 pearls, as you can see from these very sharply abbreviated lists. And notice the iron hook that I have highlighted there. It gives you the weight of absolutely everything. Here's another example. Raja Raja's elder sister, Kundavai, gave an omelet to an image. She gave two omelets, but this is one omelet. They're listed separately. It wasn't a plain gold omelet like the one I'm showing you on the far right. It was studded with gems and probably looked more like this parrot pendant that I'm showing here. And look at the details given of the gemstones. You know, it's not enough to say 441 diamonds. You've got to say 20 pure diamonds, 406 diamonds with smooth edges, five flat diamonds with smooth edges, 10 square diamonds with smooth edges. Same with the rubies. They had 54, but eight halalum are of superior quality, 17 halalum, 19 smooth, two bluish, eight unpolished. Absolutely fascinating details. And then you can look at this pearl crown, which is from a temple treasury intended for the goddess when she chose to style her hair in a knot on the left side of her head. Pearls lead me to address the Chola obsession with Sri Lanka. There were many reasons for that obsession, but one major reason was the Chola passion for pearls to adorn their sacred temple bronzes. And the resulting need to obtain easy access to those pearl fisheries in the Gulf of Mannar that lay between South India and Sri Lanka. The waters of the Gulf of Mannar sustained major pearl oyster fisheries that yielded all manner of pearls, from tiny seed pearls to those the size of a green pea. They were known from ancient times, from the, in the first century Pliny's natural history. Uh, it's known to the unknown Greek sailor who authored the logbook known as the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. If we follow it towards us, Chinese Buddhist pilgrim Fasian who traveled to Sri Lanka in the mid fifth century spoke of its pearls, so do, so too did 13th century Venetian traveler Marco Polo. So the southwest monsoon arriving along the west coast of India in early June annually swept the oyster beds that lay along the Pandya coast of India towards Sri Lanka, where they settled at the mouth of the Aruvi River at Mannar, free from the dangers of ocean currents. And the northeast return monsoon currents of end December, early January, arriving along the east coast of India, partially dislodged the oyster beds, moving some of them back towards India and the Pandian coastline. And in these shallow waters, divers dived for pearls. Look at just one inscription of Raja Raja that speaks of a gold diadem, the Virapatam, given by Raja Raja to an image of Shiva. 13,328 pearls, and then it goes on. Round pearls, roundish pearls, polished pearls, small pearls, nimbalam, paitam, ambumudu, crude pearls, twin pearls, sapati, sakatu, pearls of brilliant water, pearls of red water. And apart from the sacred bronzes, we know from historical evidence that vast quantities of pearls were sent as gifts with the embassies that the Cholas sent to China. And what about the kings and queens and other members of the royal family? Did they not wear pearls? The desire to control the pearl oyster fisheries of the Gulf of Manar is one of those overlooked reasons and one substantial reason, there are other reasons, for the Chola fixation on Sri Lanka. Let me, as I conclude, move briefly to temple inscriptions and the experience of walking around the exterior of an early Chola temple, one is made intensely aware of the fact that inscriptions cover all available spaces, including the various levels of base moldings that I showed you earlier. They flow seamlessly across the light projections and recesses of the temple walls, around niches that carry sculpted images, they are even inscribed on trellis windows. These records comprise a massive readable archive, a treasure trove of material 
that sheds light on multiple aspects of the time from socio-political circumstances through the economics of agriculture, irrigation, and trade to the religious milieu within which the temples function, and sometimes, only sometimes, to temples and to bronzes. In the midst of these very details, we hear of fascinating semi-judicial issues related to temple management. I can't resist giving you just one example. It concerns the misbehavior of two temple priests, Bhattars, at the Shivapuram temple. Their list of misdemeanors commenced with taking a pearl necklace of the goddess Uma and giving it to a concubine. And then we are told of all their other crimes. I've just given a very shortened version here. And how the temple priests met with the town residents, the Sri Maheshwaras and the Urar, and pronounced the two priests guilty of a crime against both Shiva and the king, Shiva Droha and Raja Droha. And they were sentenced to excommunication and their property, both movable and immovable, these are judicial terms that are used, including their servants, was handed over to the state. One of these days, we may be fortunate enough to have a complete inventory of Chola inscriptions. None such exists today. Even though there are some 11, somewhere between 11 and 12,000, maybe even more inscriptions there being discovered regularly, of which only the inscription on Raja Raja Chola's great temple at Tanjavur have been published fully in English translation. What I've uncovered for this book is the proverbial tip of the iceberg. The most exciting but also most frustrating issue for me, writing after close to five decades in the field, is that this inscriptional material is in full view and plain sight for anyone walking around a Chola temple. Let me end where I started. The Tamil corpus of sacred hymns are 700 in number, and they're known as the Tevaram. And that entire corpus commences with the 300 hymns of child saint Sambandar, who lived in the seventh century. His very first hymn speaks of Shiva as the thief who stole my heart, the title I chose for the book. This phrase, yen ullam kavar kalvan, serves as the refrain of each verse of this first hymn. It's very first verse, and therefore the very first verse of the entire collection of Tamil hymns, describes Shiva wearing an ear ornament, calls him the bull rider, describes the crescent moon in his locks, speaks of the sacred ash smeared on his body, and calls him the thief who stole my heart. Here it is in the original Tamil. Todudaya shediyan, vidayeri, or tu venmadi shuri, kadudaya shudalai podi pushi, yen ullam kavar kalvan. The Tamil will not surprise you once you know I'm a Tambram. Thank you. I was told earlier on that there would be mics available and that you are most welcome to ask questions, make comments, whatever you feel like. So you spoke about uh, the Chola region importing quite a bit of material from Sri Lanka, including uh, copper and pearls. What were they exchanging in return? What was a, I didn't get that. Uh, how was the Chola region paying Sri Lanka for the copper and pearls? What were they exchanging in return? An interesting question. Um, a very pertinent question, too. The whole thing is in such mystery that we don't quite know. It could have been gold, which mostly came from the Kolar mines in the territory just 
not that Rajaraja had captured, but it must have been much earlier. It could have been rice, um, which seems to have been exchanged for everything. Um, but it's not the only source. There have to be other sources as well. But certainly those bronzes which reveal that high cobalt nickel content have come from there. Um, so it's, it's all, I mean, as you can see, I mean, the fact that we didn't even know that there was a shortage of copper, so the whole thing is a big question mark and a very pertinent issue that you've raised. Are Uma and Parvati the same? And if yes, when is it referred to as Uma and when to Parvati? Um, in Tamil Nadu, she is Uma. Uh, she is the same person as, she is the, the consort of, of Shiva. And in North India and in Northern languages and in Sanskrit, she is Parvati, Parvati meaning the daughter of the mountains, and here she is always just called Uma. And in fact, Shiva is some, sometimes called Umai Kinalavan, he who is Uma's consort, in, in a way. Um, why? I don't know. But there is never Parvati in the Tamil texts. From very early times, it's always Uma. You talk about the beauty and the way that the Chola bronzes have been fashioned for almost three, four hundred years. What followed after that, the Pandyas, the Nayaks, and the Vijayanagar uh, kingdoms also had their own bronzes. So what is your view in terms of the quality of construction, the lost wax method, the compounds that they have used? Are they comparable uh, in your view? Okay. Um, so, Let's look at it this way. During the Chola period, um, all the temples were, uh, had their complement of bronzes. When the Vijayanagar, I'm coming to your actual question. When the Vijayanagar uh, kings took over, in temples which had all the Chola bronzes, and if they were still there and intact, and there was a historical circumstance for them being buried which is where all these, uh, the, anything green with a green tinge is a buried bronze. Um, then it was only if they didn't have their bronzes that they created their own bronzes. So there are less Vijayanagar bronzes in total than there are um, Chola bronzes. Um, the artists had a, a break of about 100 and 125 to 130 years. Uh, there was a Muslim sultanate in Madurai, and they were waiting for them to go away. They had buried bronzes, and some of those bronzes have been emerging only in the 20th century and in, into the 21st century. But there had been no demand during that period. When they started creating bronzes again, they created quite beautiful bronzes following the same system of beauty and, and proportions. But it is the way it is in the sense that it had changed a little bit. If those were the only bronzes we had, we'd probably say they were exquisite bronzes. But because we have the Chola bronzes, which somehow have, um, I don't know, it's, it's the earliest period of making these bronzes and filling the temples with it. There was a great religious fervor, which was combined with fantastic craftspeople, wealth in the hands of those who could support them. And they just, do, you do see that they are um, sort of a perfection. Well, there are really, really good 
Vijayanagar bronzes, but you can tell that they are of the later period, by which time figures had become over slender and over elongated and a little, you know, it's, um, I mean, if, if you're a lover of, a Chola, of Chola bronzes, you tend to feel that the Vijayanagar had lost something of that intensity that came through this religious belief system and fervor and, and that something is lost. But they are wonderful bronzes too. I don't know whether that answered your question, but it's about the best I can do. So um, I noticed that there, the middle finger of Shiva or Uma is like always empty and um, it's not ringed. Is there any meaning behind it? And uh, also like, uh, I would like to know if there's any further intentions about the half woman, half man sculpture of Shiva. Um, you're asking about the quality of the workmanship, or are you asking about, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand it. Are you asking about the, um, that whole concept of half woman? Yeah, I'm asking about like the concept of like the half woman. It's a, half it's a difficult, sculpture. that's a difficult one to answer. Um, it's, it's um, those who try to explain it usually don't explain it. For instance, there's a lovely poem. It's a Sanskrit poem. So it's, it's a form known in North India too in which the poet turns to Shiva, addresses Shiva and said, well, you're very fortunate in having this beautiful wife of yours as half of you, but on the other hand, you must be so desperate because you cannot turn and look at her face. You know, so they avoid the absolute true meaning of it. It would be very easy to sort of say that uh, it's an affirmation of the fact that Godhead can be both male and female. It's also in a way easy to say that it is an affirmation of the fact that we all have male and female combined in us. Um, it becomes that, it, it becomes that very popular form in which all the poetry is addressed to um, to them, which shows, like with the naked beggar, the begging lord, shows the awareness of the incongruity, and yet it, it, it emphasizes the, uh, the beautiful sentiments about it. So it, th this is one of those things that we would have to talk about for <laughs> an hour or two to get any further with it. I noticed on one of your maps that uh, Sri Vijaya was mentioned, and I wondered how much, if any, of Chola sculpture is to be found in Sumatra or Java. I'm finding it very difficult to hear because of the mark. Did you get that? Oh, you repeat that I'll repeat it. I noticed on one of your maps that Sri Vijaya was mentioned. And I wondered, therefore, are there any sculptures of Chola origins in Java or Sumatra? Um, the Cholas, Chola portraits are very few. We do know that there, there was a portrait of King Raja Raja, et cetera. The, no, I'm sorry, the, maybe I didn't make myself clear but I'm interested in the influence of Chola. Yes, I do realize what you're getting at. Uh -huh, okay. um, the, the, the kings, they never controlled Java or Sumatra. They were interested in, um, there are trading communities, pre-Raja Raja period, early Chola period. Um, they controlled certain ports where what was their interest in Java Sumatra? 
it was trade with China. In order to get into the China Sea, there were only two straits. One is the Malacca Strait, long, narrow one, and then there's this tiny little Sunda Strait. And it is along these points that you find trading communities, no political rule. Trading communities which seem to have been there for some time as they, and they are using very often the Tamil language in their inscriptions and saying, you know, I have control of this port and I have just established that every ship that comes here will have to give me so much in gold in order to enter and trade here. So there are trading connections very little apart from that in, in any, the, the religion has gone there much before the Cholas. So the Cholas are supposed to have been interested. They had one expedition there, and the expedition seems to have been entirely to secure that those routes, the two routes into the South China Sea. Everybody, I mean, it was started at one end of the Arab world, and it went all the, which was also interested in China, and everywhere along the way, Sri Lanka and then Sumatra were some of those points at which trade went along. So there's not any physical um, evidence of uh, influence, and I think the best way I can answer that is to sort of say to you, yes, the religion was originally taken from India, but if you look at a, um, say, an image of Ganesha, in, in each country it has developed in its own way from earlier roots, so you can tell an, a Javanese um, Ganesha is very different from a Vietnam Ganesha, from the Cham country, which is very different from a Cambodian Ganesha. They're all Ganeshas, they've got the same iconographic attributes, but the treatment of the body, the treatment of it, you, the, a Thai Ganesha, you can tell them all apart. So it has been developed in each country along, in, in its own way, in other words, that there is no direct a uh, connection back with the mainland. It has gone along the trading routes, it has developed and in its own way. Thank you so much for that. Vidya, thank you again. This, um, th your talk and those amazingly beautiful photographs was just so enthralling. Um, I, I have no words with which to say a big, big, big thank you, but just hope that this is the first of many visits back to Chicago and to the Art Institute and um, can't wait to welcome you back again. Thank you again. And uh, lastly, but not least, I'd like to again thank Barbara Levy-Keeper for um, making this lecture possible. And thank you to every one of you for joining us this evening for our first in-person uh, Kipper lecture. Thank you again. Bye. <laughs>